afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the All Bugs, Good and Bad webinar for October. Uh, today's presentation will be Home Landscape Sprayer Calibration presented by Plez Bradley from the University of Arkansas. And if you have any questions during the webinar, please post them in the chat box to the left. We will be monitoring that and make sure, and we'll make sure that your questions get answered at the end of the presentation. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Plaz, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Well, welcome to everybody. I hope everybody's doing well, and especially our friends in Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas. I hope they're all doing fine, safe, and sound, out of harm's way. Looks, looks bad over there. Um, my name's Plaz Spradley. And in case you wonder, Plez is an old family name. Uh, it was originally Pleasant, uh, but my mom decided it no longer applied. And I think she was joking. Um, so let's see, I'll just go ahead and advance here. I am the pesticide safety education specialist for the University of Arkansas. I've been in this position for 20 Seven years, I've been with the university for 34. Uh, I also have a small fruit farm, and that uh, is pertinent because I do a lot of backpack spraying, uh, pump-up type spraying, which is what I'm going to concentrate on today. And I'm assuming most of uh, y'all are using similar type sprayers, pump-up sprayers, maybe a boom sprayer on a uh, ATV, something like that for larger applications. But calibration, it really doesn't matter what kind of sprayer you're using uh, because calibration is basically the same for all those. And I'll explain that as we uh, go along. And I'm also going to try to give you some tips on calibrating drop spreaders and rotary spreaders. Even though there's a lot of problems with those, if you're trying to put out pesticides, and when I say pesticide, I mean herbicides, insecticides, fungicides, any of them. So they're not really the best equipment for putting out pesticides, but they can be used and you can calibrate them. And we'll talk about that towards the end of the slide set. So let's just uh, jump on in here. Oh, and I also, you know, when you put together slide sets, they wanted my slide set 10 days in advance. Well, normally I work up until the last minute before I make a presentation. So I've already seen things, so a couple of typos and some things I left off. And one thing I did leave off was talking about spot spraying, which is something a lot of people you're going to be using uh, quite a bit. Uh, where you're not spraying a large area, you're spot spraying for insects or fungicides, and, and the label gives you a spot spraying recommendation. So even though I don't have a slide, I think I've got a slide that's going to remind me to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but if I forget it, ask a question if you've got a question about spot spraying. So what are we trying to do with cal uh, calibration? Well, we're trying to meter out specific amounts of carrier and chemicals, and carrier is water in this case. So, you know, your sprayer, you're going to have water and chemicals, maybe pesticide plus surfactants or other things, but mainly uh, carrier and chemicals. And we want to put it out in an even pattern at a certain amount. Uh, now, like I mentioned with spot spraying, the pattern is not that important. But if you're applying pre-emerge herbicides, you have to to calibrate and put it out evenly to avoid problems. And uh, application types are either broadcast, which is over a large area like your yard, you're trying to spray the whole yard, or maybe a strip treatment, which is what I do in my blueberries. I spray a strip down each side of the blueberry rows to keep the weed down because it's a hue pick operation. So that's just a strip application or a spot treatment, individual plants or small areas. And if you don't, calibrate and do a good job of application. You're wasting money. Uh, you're wasting your time. If you don't get enough out there, you don't control what you're trying to control. If you put too much out, you're wasting money. But then damages from drift, if your solution in your sprayers is uh, too strong and you drift, you're going to have problems over under application. And then of course, the possibility of adverse health effects. If you're spraying fruits and vegetables, you don't want more uh, on those than more chemical than is recommended. Uh, but plus, if you're spraying your yard, you can let your kids or your pets out. You don't want more out there than is required. Uh, 
here's some examples of what happens if you put out too high of a rate. Now, this is Roundup run, runoff. In my whole career, we've talked about how Roundup has no soil activity. And this looks like it does. Where they sprayed on the right-hand side, uh, this is a baseball field, obviously, so they were spraying the infield, trying to control the weeds that were coming up. But it actually, that's not uh, soil contamination, per se. It, it didn't it didn't affect the roots of the grass on the left. What it was, it was such a high rate, they used too high of a rate of Roundup on the right, and they got a heavy rainfall, and it physically moved the Roundup over to that short grass, and enough of it was either in the water or maybe some soil particles that had Roundup, and it actually killed some grass. Uh, so that was just an over-application of Roundup. Oh, no, that slide didn't show. Oh, that's a killer. Uh, it was, it's a, I got it from uh, the Auburn uh, Facebook page, uh, the turf grass. And you guys could go look. I'd urge you what it is. It's a yard. And if you see it, it's somebody sprayed. And it's just this serpentine patch of grass killed all throughout. And I can't believe it's not showing up. I don't know what happened there. Uh, but obviously, the guy didn't either put the wrong chemical in the tank or uh, forgot to clean out his tank properly. But when you see the picture, not only did he use the wrong chemical, but he did a very poor job of putting it out evenly because, it's like I said, it's just this serpentine strip with there's dead grass that's about 12 inches wide all through this huge yard, He's this ribbon of it, but then there's green grass that he didn't spray. So if he was trying to make an even application, uh, it didn't work. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm, I've lost my slides here. Okay, we can see them here. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. I am going to pull up. Uh, I'm going to pull up on my uh, computer so I can kind of follow. Well, uh, what slide am I on now? Can you tell me? Sure, you're one on the one that says application equipment, set it up, operate, I, and maintain yeah. it correctly. Did I skip? Uh, how many slides did I go past the uh, one on the turf? I can go back to the one, one. The one on the turf where it, it's got the zigzag pattern? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, why don't we just start after that one? And that one will say application okay. equipment, set, select the right equipment. Okay. Have you got me there? Uh, yep. We're right there. And, and if you would just say next, we'll go ahead and forward your slides. Thank you very much. That'll help me out. Okay. Application equipment. We want to get the uh, best equipment you can afford. Now, I've said discount stores rarely carry the best. There's always exceptions to that. Uh, there's big... Uh, some of the big box stores, and I shouldn't talk about Walmart since they're headquartered here, but you're not going to get much of a sprayer at a Walmart. But go look for a good sprayer, and really, if you can find one that has a nozzle that you can replace and put different nozzles in there, you're in a you're probably looking at a pretty good sprayer. And Solo, Hudson, DB Smith, Chapin, all make good sprayers. Look for those. You can also look online for those manufacturers and do just fine. Uh, next. And then your application equipment, you just want to take care of it, set it up, operate it correctly, uh, see what the dealer says, the owner's manual, internet resources. Here's one of the statements I said you might be amazed at what is on YouTube videos. I, I think I should be a little more specific <laughs> and say at what kind of instructional videos you could find on YouTube. Uh, because I, I promise you, you could look up uh, the dealer or the manufacturer may have videos about their equipment, how to calibrate it, and things like that. Next slide. So before you calibrate or spray, you should always read the pesticide label. I mean, that's just an absolute. Read the label, read the label, read the label, and follow it. Look at the spray equipment manual on maintenance, things like that. 
Uh, and then the extension guidelines. And I think they are going to put up some links to extension guidelines. Every state has some good information out there. There's just so much good information uh, coming from the universities on calibration, chemical selection, and all that. Next slide, please. Um, the nozzles and orifices are nozzles and orifices, just another way to say that. But the size of that, the pressure you're using, and the fluid characteristics, which isn't a big deal for us, but pressure and nozzle size make a, uh, can make a big difference on your flow rate, which is you're talking about the amount of liquid and chemical coming out, so gallons per acre, gallons per thousand square feet, ounces per thousand square feet. And we're going to spend some time determining that. And then droplet size. Uh, you really want to avoid those real small droplets. You, uh, there are reasons to use them, but... Uh, Droplet size is important to avoid drift. Next slide, please. So hopefully you can get a sprayer where you can choose your own nozzle. Uh, cone nozzles are pretty good for many uses, but a flat fan nozzle is better for a precise, even application uh, like pre-emerge herbicides or something that you really want to make sure you're getting the right rate and you're making very even, even coverage. And one of the best things you can do is check your pattern on concrete or asphalt on a sunny day. And if you spray on those, you can see where your pattern, like if you're using a flat fan nozzle, you can see that it may uh, initially look like it's 28 inches wide when you spray the pattern, but the edges uh, evaporate much more quickly. And that means you're not getting the full amount right there, and you would have to overlap on those. So I really recommend it, and I'll talk about that as we calibrate. It, check your pattern, and when you're trying to calibrate, it's always good to do it on concrete or asphalt where you can see the pattern, see what your overlap is. Next slide, please. I talked about the uh, tips that you can change in and out on your sprayer. Uh, so look at the wand and see whether it has a way to change tips. And that's a picture of just a flat fan nozzle. Uh, some of them are color-coded. T-Jet is one of the industry standards, but there's more. There's Delavan and some others. Uh, and that's a stainless steel tip. It'll last forever with a home use. So those are those are really nice tips. And you can change things with those rather than worrying about your pressure or your speed. You can change your flow rate very quickly with a uh, nozzle. Next slide. Medium to coarse size droplets uh, usually provide good coverage and reduce the potential for drift. And coarse is a relative term. Uh, we're not talking about something that would come out of a medicine dropper. A coarse droplet for spray is actually a pretty small drop. Uh, but, and, and there's ways to determine that with the nozzle and all that, but you can kind of eyeball it with home owner uh, situations. What you really want to avoid is that real fine mist. Uh, if you're using a, one of the cone sprayers and you've got it adjusted down almost all the way, uh, try to avoid that. That's just going to drift. But sometimes insecticides and fungicides are going to work better with a relatively smaller drop. You know, you're really looking for good coverage with fungicides and insecticides. Next slide, please. Avoid the uh, extremely large droplets. They can result in poor coverage. Uh, and maintain a constant uh, spray pressure uh, for a precise application. With a pump-up sprayer, you know, don't let it get all the way down where it's barely coming out. And try not to pump it up as far as it'll go because you're just generating more small droplets and act, asking for drift. But maintain as constant of a pressure as you can. Uh, next slide, please. So I talked about these flat fans, the commonly used tip. They're very good, but uh, you've got to hold them at the right height above your target, whether it's bare ground or a plant that's four inches tall. And they do. The edges uh, don't get as much spray, so you have to overlap your spray with a flat fan to get an even, uniform spray pattern. Next, please. Drift control nozzles. 
they're fantastic. Uh, probably not needed for most home type applications, but they're not that expensive. Uh, they run six or seven dollars. Uh, and, and the reason they're not expensive, if you look at the tip on the right, it's there's a little hole there where the name of the tip is running vertically, but there's a little hole, and it's, that's called an air induction. And as the spray solution is running out towards the tip, which in this case the tip is at the top, uh, it sucks in air and it incorporates air into the spray droplet. It makes a much bigger droplet with the same amount of liquid, and that's less prone to drift. And these that's very simple technology, but they work fantastic. Uh, the tip on the left is a turbo. It's kind of the same theory. They don't introduce air, but it kind of works the same way. And you can just Google. If you uh, Google air induction uh, nozzle tip, you'll see it. And they had them on Amazon and Google for 6 $7. And you just put them in the uh, end of the wand like you would a flat fan nozzle. Next slide, please. Now, streaking causes, and you guys were able to see it, even though I couldn't, uh, that yard sprayer, uh, that is classic streaking there. Not enough overlap with each pass. And then if you get the boom or the spray nozzle down too close, you're not going to get the overlap uh, that you uh, might want. And, and that's really with uh, a boom sprayer. That diagram I've got in the lower right-hand corner is a boom sprayer. So it's critical when you've got a boom sprayer with multiple nozzles that you operate it at the correct height. But it's important to operate a nozzle at the correct height anyway. You get the even, uh, nice, even size pattern. And for flat fan nozzles, it's normally 17 to 19 inches or what they, what they recommend as far as above the target. And as you can see, the overlap they're calling for there, the nozzles are spaced 20 inches apart. Uh, but you're getting an actual spray width of 30 because of the overlap, so 30 inches, so 10 inches of overlap on each side. Uh, next slide, please. So proper overlap is essential. Uh, you can lay out flags uh, for your, uh, if you've got a flat fan nozzle, you know, say it's going to be 24 inches, so you can uh, spread your flags every 20 inches across the ends and aim towards that flag so you're walking in a straight pattern. Uh, you can add dyes to the solution. And I've got a picture of a dog where a guy had made an a application of turf and he used this blue dye that you can add so he could see where he had applied the chemical. And uh, they told me for sure, even though the dog went out there and rolled around, uh, they cleaned him up immediately and there were no ill effects to the, the pet. Uh, but it's, you can see the dyes work pretty well. Next slide, please. So just to reiterate, for large application areas, broadcast application, a flat fan nozzle is probably the best nozzle you could use. Keep them 17 to 19 inches above the target. So if it was bare ground, 17, 19 inches. But if you had two inch tall grass, you would want to go 19 to 21 inches. If you had uh, corn plants out in your vegetable garden that were uh, 10 inches, you would want to be 27 to 29 inches above. So uh, just keep that in mind. Next slide. Before you ever start mixing chemical in your sprayer, put some water in it, turn the pump on or pump it up, and see if there's any leaks, clogged nozzles, uh, you've got to do that every spring before you turn the sprayer on. Uh, this spring I had a pump-up sprayer. I pumped it full of water. I got water in it, pumped it, and I found out that the uh, wand had cracked. There was water left in it over the winter, froze, and it cracked my wand, so I had to repair that. But uh, you want to find out about all those leaks and everything before you mix chemical. Next slide. So now I'm going to get into calibration. It's critical for even applications, larger areas, uh, herbicides on turf, large ornamental plantings, things like that. It's not as critical for spot spraying. And this is where I just want to mention uh, a little bit about uh, figuring out spot spraying when you're dealing with percentages. I've done this long enough that I know a lot of people have trouble with percentages. 
And if you've got, if you look at the label and it says for spot spraying, use a 1% solution per gallon. Well, a gallon is 128 ounces. So 1% of 128 is 1.28 ounces. So let's say 1.3 ounces. And that's how much chemical you would put into one gallon of water. Now, 1.3 ounces, if you're using tablespoons and teaspoons, an ounce is 30 milliliters or two tablespoons. So if you had 1.3 ounces, that would either be 40 milliliters or two tablespoons plus two teaspoons. Now, if you're not writing that down, it's hard to remember. I have an app on my phone that's called Convert Units, which I really recommend getting a conversion app. And you can go through and see exactly, you know, we're dealing with ounces, and then you've got milliliters. I prefer milliliters, but not all of my measuring devices have it. But you can figure it out if you learn how to convert. But percentage, you know, one gallon is basically couple, two and two-thirds tablespoons, uh, 1% of one gallon. Next slide. It should say calibration of liquids. One of the first things, uh, keys to calibrating is you have to determine the flow rate, whether it's gallons per acre, gallons per thousand square feet, ounces per thousand square feet, but you've got to determine that flow rate. Uh, nothing dry. Well, and I had a perfect example this year, a guy that's had a pesticide license for years called me about spraying for army worms, told him what the rate was, and he asked me, well, how much do I put in the spray tank? And, I, you know, it's just like, come on, buddy. you got to figure out how many acres do you cover with your spray, with your sprayer when you fill it up. you got to know the gallons per acre before you ever start. It's not a matter of just dumping stuff in the tank and taking off. Next slide. Well, we're going to talk about that. A few basic calibration tools. Uh, you're going to be laying off some area. You're going to be measuring liquids. You're going to time how long it takes to do certain things. So there's some basic uh, tools you might want to have. Tape measure, stopwatch, uh, calibrated cup, uh, flags to mark things off. Next slide. Now here is a method it requires no calculations. It's called the ounce method. You can use it on an agricultural sprayer with a 200 or 120 foot boom, or you can use it for a one gallon sprayer. Uh, now it's a, a little bit different setup with a boom sprayer. I'm, I'm going to concentrate on a single nozzle sprayer. Okay, I'm seeing. Okay. I, I, I was just looking at some notes. Next slide, please. So, to determine gallons per acre with the ounce method, with a pump up sprayer or even a pistol style, uh, type sprayer hooked to a hose, uh, the easiest way to do that would be to lay out a calibration plot. It's 18 and a half feet by 18 and a half feet. And if you did it on concrete, even better. In fact, this one would, is almost critical to do on concrete if you're doing it for the first time. And that 100, uh, 18 and a half by 18 and a half feet is significant because it's one 128th of an acre and there's 128 ounces in a, in a gallon. So spray that area evenly. See if your pattern's evenly. Everything evaporates about the same time. Keep steady pace. Make sure your tank is pumped up before starting. You don't want to have to stop once you start. Next slide. And then once you see how long it takes to spray, say 17 seconds, well, you just collect the liquid from your nozzle for that amount of time with the pump, with the, uh, the spray tank or with the sprayer pumped up the same amount as it was. And you collect that for that number of seconds, 17 seconds. And however many ounces you collect is the gallons per acre. Can't be simpler, but you should always do it at least a couple of times to get an average. Make sure uh, you're right on there. So ounce method works real well. Uh, you can find that uh, online too. 
Next slide, please. If you're not using the house calibration method, it's still easy. And this is the method I use for my pump up backpack sprayer. Next slide. And all you have to do for this formula is determine the spray width or nozzle spacing. A nozzle spacing would be if you had a boom, spray width if you've got a single nozzle, your speed, and your gallons per minute per nozzle. Next slide. So here's the formula. Gallons per acre equals gallons per minute times a constant of 5,940 over your speed times your width. So if you were using a single nozzle, let's say a flat fan nozzle, you'd get over the concrete, you'd spray it at about 18 inches above the ground, and you would see what the effective spray width was. Uh, for my nozzle, excuse me, it's like 24 inches. So I plug in 24 inches, and it has to be inches. You can even do these boomless sprayers on an ATV. Uh, the one I have has two nozzles that are similar on the ends of the boom, even though it's called a boomless and then it's got a different nozzle in the middle. I just take the total width, which is 25 feet, and convert that to inches. And I plug that in there, and it works to calibrate that boomless sprayer on ATV. Next slide. Uh, if you're doing a good steady walking speed, uh, you can estimate usually about three miles per hour. Uh, you can check that. I say there's a simple formula for motorized equipment. You can use the same for, uh, formula for uh, walking speed too. And you can even get, uh, there's an app, I've got one called Speedometer that works real well. Now, when you get into the two or three miles per hour, it's not as accurate. But if you're using like a tractor mounted or ATV or lawn tractor mounted pulled or something, uh, it'll probably work pretty well. Next slide. So the speed calculation, you just lay off uh, air, uh, distance. I put 100 feet. It's not critical. Um, because you've got the constant numbers, you just lay off a certain distance and you cover that amount of time and you see how long it takes. In this case, I said 23 seconds to cover 100 feet, whether I was walking or whether I was on a uh, lawnmower with a sprayer. And then uh, it, it's the distance times 60 over the time it took times 88. And 60 and 88 are constants. And in that case, you see it's three miles per hour. So we've got the speed part for the example I'm going to give. And speed is very important. It's a linear relationship. So if you're putting out uh, 10 gallons per acre and you slow down half the speed you were going, you've just doubled your rate. So you have to be careful about that. Next slide. Now to finish out this formula, we need the gallons per minute per nozzle. It's real easy to pump up your sprayer, catch it for a minute or 30 seconds and double it and see how usually you're going to be catching ounces. Next slide. But you have to convert ounces to gallons for this formula. So you just divide the ounces by 128. And in this case, it's 0.27 gallons per minute is what we got. Remember, there's 128 ounces in a gallon. Uh, next slide. So now we're going to plug all of this into this formula. 5,940, which is that constant, times the gallons per minute, 0.27, over three miles per hour was our walking speed, and we had a uh, spray width on our particular nozzle of 20 inches. When we work all that out, on this uh, example, we get 27 gallons per acre. Next slide. So we know our gallons per acre. We got that done. Now we're going to go to the label, see what the rate is per acre and what the tank capacity is or the mix amount. So next slide, we'll plug all this in. So we're going to use a two-gallon pump-up sprayer with a herbicide rate of three ounces per acre. And we know our gallons per acre is 27 gallons uh, per acre out of our sprayer. So we've got a two-gallon tank. And if it's putting out 27 gallons per acre, that means a full two-gallon tank is going to spray 0 0.07 acres with every full tank. Three ounces uh, per acre is our rate. And three ounces per acre times all we're going to cover is 0 0.07 acres, so we have to make that conversion. And it's going to be 0 0.21 ounces per two gallons of water. 
So we're going to measure out 0.21 ounces per acre. Now that's, if you converted all that, you would see that's just over a teaspoon. It's, I think, six milliliters, and a teaspoon is roughly five milliliters. So it would be just over a teaspoon per two-gallon tank. Next slide. Now, uh, fairly common in uh, turf-type herbicides or, or a homeowner, they're going to say uh, they're going to give you a, a recommendation for 1,000 square feet. So to do that, it's kind of the same way as the ounce method. You just lay out a plot that's 32 by 32 feet, and that's 1,000 square feet. Uh, once again, on concrete, if possible, spray it, see how long it takes. Do it evenly. Next slide. And then you uh, do it a, a couple of times, collect the output, see how long it takes, and once you collect it, the ounces you get in that amount of time is what your ounces per thousand square feet is. Next slide. So here's an example how to use that. If it took three minutes to spray a thousand square feet, and when you collected the water from your sprayer, uh, spray tip for three minutes, collected 120 ounces. So your rate of uh, is uh, 120 ounces per thousand square feet. And if you had an insecticide or a herbicide that said three ounces per thousand square feet, you'd put three ounces in 120 ounces of water and you'd be ready to go. Next slide. So if you wanted to increase the rate, uh, say your sprayer was putting out, uh, just as an example, you calibrated your sprayer and you got five gallons per acre. But the uh, label says this material needs to be put out in a minimum of 10 gallons of water per acre. Well, you've got to make a major adjustment there. The two easiest ways to do it is slow your speed down by half or increase your nozzle size. And that's the beauty of having a sprayer where you can change nozzles out, where you could have a series of three or four sprayers or three or four three or four tips that could make a big difference in your uh, spray rate. Uh, you, you know, don't increase pressure. Don't pump it up more. That's the wrong way to change your rate. And all it's probably going to do is just increase your drip potential. If you want to decrease the rate, do the opposite. Speed up or use a smaller nozzle. Next slide. Now, dry flowable formulations, uh, you've got to really be careful. Those are the ones that are dry. You mix them with water uh, because with, if it's a wettable powder, you have to weigh it. But on dry flowables, you measure them on a volume. But you have to use the measuring device that comes with the chemical. Don't use a teaspoon, which is for liquid measurements, to measure a dry amount of uh, dry flowable pesticide. They'll, they'll almost always give you a measuring device and use that. And when you're through with the pesticide, throw that measuring device away. You need to always use the, the measuring device, measuring cup that comes with the particular product you bought. It has to do with the density of the uh, pesticide, and it can change even for the same product with different packages. So just use the device that comes with it. Next slide. Now these... Uh, quickly go through these uh, rotary and drop spreaders. And many thanks to John Boyd who put this slide set together. And he always says, you know, the last thing you want to use is one of these if it really needs to be a precise application, but you can make them work. Uh, and, but if I was going to put out pre-emerged herbicides, I would use a spray and not a weed and feed and try to get it out really easily. But the weed and feeds, they usually have such a low percentage of herbicide that you can you can overdo it a little bit and not cause big problems. So uh, the manufacturers know what they're doing. So rotary spreader first. Next slide that should have uh, the chart on it. And uh, like John says, the best situation is where you bought a company's spreader to put out their products, like Scott products with a Scott sprayer or Lesco there with Lesco products, because then you're in pretty good shape to put it out correctly. You check the label for settings and things like that. Next slide. But you can check uh, on the uh, sprayers. Uh, 
Uh, if you really want to go to the expense, but the, the commercial guys will do this. You use uh, catch pans. You spread them out uh, at even intervals. Uh, in this case, it's going to be two feet. And you have something in them to keep the dry material from bouncing out. So like some kind of, uh, not netting, but they, they make baffle type stuff to put in the bottom. It almost looks like the stuff that goes in light fixtures, um, where it's a crisscross pattern, crosshatch pattern. And you can put them in the bottom of the trays there. So you would just push your uh, spreader through there and you collect in each pan and put it in an individual uh, tube here so you can get a visual look at the amount that came out. Oh, I'm sorry, that was the next slide. I'm forgetting to say that. So you see there, there's a, sp a spreader in the middle with the pans laid out outdoors. Now let's go to the next slide. And it's got just the test tubes. And it's showing you the three test tubes in the middle have two inches a piece. Well, what you want to do is go out to the test tube that has half of that amount, or one inch, and that's going to give you your effective swat width. So at six feet out from the center, it goes down to one inch. So that's telling you six feet to one side or 12 feet total is the effective swat width of uh, that rotary spreader. Next slide. Use the... Uh, Operator and the product you don't want to switch things up. You want everybody walking. You want the guy that's going to make the application to calibrate the equipment and use the product that you're going to put out. Use that for calibration. Uh, you can start with the spreader and uh, my with the, looking at the product label and you can't see it, but it says and arrive at an initial setting to put it on and then treat a known area and see how much is left. Weigh that and subtract it from the original. So if you had 5,000 square feet and the rate was 2 pounds per 5,000 square feet and you came back and when you do all those calculations, you know, you were, you're actually putting out 1 pound uh, instead of the 2 pounds. So, you know, you would adjust it and uh, try it again or else just go back out to the site you made and made another application and offset it by 50% from the tracks you put down the first time. Next slide. It's not a good idea to apply at right angles with rotary spreaders uh, for any kind of pattern irregular irregularities. It's better to just cut your rate and your swap width and double up that way. Uh, right angles uh, don't do what you think they would do. It's better to cut the rate, go in the same direction, and cut your swap width. And these uh, header strips, uh, next slide, please. Because rotary spreaders... You don't want to go all the way to the edge. Uh, make a couple of trips around the treated area or put some header strips on either end. That way you've got a, a place to turn around and you can start back uh, before you get to your where you're going to make the application and get up to walking speed and then open the lever and start spraying. So those header strips or peripheral strip around the areas is a good idea. Next slide. Drop spreaders. Next slide. Uh, you got to understand that a drop spreader works. The uh, the uh, actual spreader part of it, or the drop part, works off one wheel. So if you're turning while you're using a drop spreader, it's either going to speed up the droppage or slow it down, depending on which way you're turning. So another reason to have the header uh, strips around it. Uh, Critical applications shouldn't be made in high winds, and that's either with a drop spreader or a rotary spreader because it can really influence what comes out. You want your material dry and in good shape, and it's a good idea to use something with a uniform particle size uh, because the larger particles can move around in the uh, spreader tank itself as they're jostling around. Triple 13 is probably what they're showing on the top of that circle there. Uh, and that's uh, that's a tough fertilizer to put out with a either a rotary spreader or a drop spreader. Next slide. But uh, before you fill it up, I made this mistake. Close the gate before you fill up the hopper. Uh, don't overfill it. A lot of the good ones will come with a screen in place, so those big chunks that have uh, formed won't get down to the uh, mechanism that breaks it up oh, or distributes it, so you want to keep those out. Push the uh, spreader, don't pull it. 
and then try to keep your speed constant to how you calibrate it. And we're going to show calibration here in a second. Uh, next slide. Start walking before opening the gate. Close it before stopping. That's why the header strips are there. Keep it at the same height. Want the same person making these applications that calibrates the equipment. Walk in straight line. Use the spreader wheel marks, as I said, or put out flags. Next slide. Now, you can. Uh, a really easy way to figure out calibration is to build a catch pan. Uh, plastic gutter, I'm going to show a picture here in the middle with two end caps, some way to tie it to the spreader itself. Um, and uh, in the load product, travel at uniform speed for a known distance, weigh it just up and down. So next slide. So here's a picture, just some uh, rain guttering, cheap rain guttering. Uh, from a hardware store with the end caps and make it the width of your drop spreader. Next slide. That just shows how it's attached to that one. Chain, whatever, but just get it right underneath where the uh, drop slots are. Next slide. Check the product settings just to start off with, what they recommend, Then, but check it to see how it works. Next slide. Uh, just showing the selection from the previous slide. Next slide now. Now, here's how you do it. Uh, if your sprayer is a three foot wide drop spreader, it's always easy to work with even numbers. So three feet wide, lay out a course 33.3 feet long. With flags, you know, get up, get up to speed before you open it. Go that 33 feet with your drop spreader uh, going and then weigh that amount. That's going to tell you per square feet. So as an example, we're going to put out a herbicide called Pendulum 2G and the rate is 3.44 pounds per thousand square feet. Well, we've laid off a course. Our spreader is three feet wide and the course is 33 and a third feet long. So that's 100 square feet. Well, the rate is 3.44 pounds per thousand square feet. So we're going to be doing an area a tenth that size. So in the second line there, we're going to take a tenth times 3.44 to see in that 100 square feet, we want to shoot and apply for 0.34 pounds per acre. That's what we're going for. And 3.34 pounds per acre is the same as 5.5 ounces. just depends on how you're weighing it. So we're looking for 5.5 ounces of a dry material or 0.34 pounds. Next slide. Oh, wait. Oh, well, no, there is no, the next slide is just the end slide. Uh, so that uh, explains that. Uh, I really want to thank John Boyd, uh, distinguished professor. We signed a semi-retired here at the university and then Aaron Patton, who's now with Purdue University, but he was formerly with the University of Arkansas in our Department of Horticulture. Uh, they provided some of these pictures and that's all I've got. So I'm ready for questions or the next step. Uh, um, yes. Taylor, was there any questions in the box? There are no questions in the box. All right, well, if nobody has any questions, thank you, Plez. Um, you will see four poll questions popping up on your screen. If you will please take just a moment and answer those, we would appreciate your feedback. And we're also putting a link to a very short Qualtrics survey in, um, uh, in the chat box, if you will look over there and take that really quick. Um, but I'd I do think we have some questions. If you'll um, type that into the question box, uh, we will get it answered. So hold on um, just a second while we get that question for Cliff. So Linda had asked if there's any chance of getting the slides sent out for, for all those different formulas. Uh, 
Uh, it was my understanding it'll be on the All Bugs webinar site. Is that correct, Ellen? Um, the recording of this presentation will be on there, but I don't think that we have any way of emailing it out because we don't have email addresses of participants. I would be happy to send a copy of the slides to anybody that wants them. Um, my email address is P Spradley, so P S P R A D L E Y at U A E X dot E D U. Can I put that? Uh, okay, Ellen, you put it up. Thanks. Got that in the chat box. So, yeah, that's. Um, just send me a request, and, and I can, and it's not a very large slide set. It'll fit on a normal email without a problem, I believe, uh, but I can get it to you, and uh, uh, feel free to use it. But there's also extension publications that would cover everything I've covered, too. Um, Jeannie, I think that we can uh, take the questions down now. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Join yes, us. Yes, thank you. We will have another All Bugs webinar in November. <laughs>